Perspectives panel. I'm Janet Rossand. I'm President and Scientific Director of the Gardner Foundation. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the Gardner Foundation operates, commonly known as Toronto. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashnabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And as we know, many of you are joining us from beyond Toronto and even Canada. We encourage you to learn more about the land on which you live, work and play at nativeland.ca. I'm happy to welcome you to our fourth Global Perspectives panel of 2022. And today you're gonna to hear from leading global experts, Gerner laureates, and from community perspectives on what we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll explore how we can extend these lessons moving forward to address our preparedness for future pandemics, equitable healthcare, and the role of science in countering the spread of misinformation and distrust. If you've got any questions or thoughts for our panelists, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. We note that we'll be monitoring the questions and encourage everyone to be respectful and courteous. Now, our core mission at the Gardner Foundation is to recognize and reward international excellence in fundamental research that impacts human health through our seven annual prestigious Canada Gardner Awards. But beyond the awards, we believe in the power of open scientific discourse to better engage the public, understand the problems we face, and work together to find solutions. Throughout the year, Gardner hosts various events that convene leaders in their respective scientific fields to do just that, and to inspire the next generation of researchers. In exciting news, we will host our first annual science literacy workshop on September the 28th, moderated by the internationally acclaimed educator and molecular biologist, Dr. Raven Baxter, better known as Dr. Raven the Science Maven. We'll explore how to leverage social media for science with an incredible lineup, including Dr. Lisa Richardson and Tim Caulfield, we're also delighted to kick off a return to in-person events with Gardner Science Week in October. We hope you'll join us for a great week of live in-person celebrations and webcast symposia, mentoring sessions, panels, and a gala for this year's awardees. Stay tuned for updates on our website, gardner.org, and on social media, at Gardner Awards. Finally, on behalf of the Gardner Foundation, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor for today's events, Tell Us Health as well as our presenting partner, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. Hosting the panel today is Associate Deputy Minister of Innovation Science and Economic Development, I said, Francis Bilodeau. Prior to his appointment in January 2022, he held various executive positions across the public service, including Chief Information Officer of the Government of Canada, Assistant Secretary of Digital Policy and Services at the Treasury Board, and Founding Assistant Deputy Minister for the Privy Council's Office, Results and Delivery Unit. He's also worked in a number of senior roles at Infrastructure Canada, where he helped lead the development and implementation of multiple generations of federal infrastructure programming. He brings his digital insights to the table today. Uh, Francis. Well, thank you, Janet. Um, and good morning and afternoon to, to all of you who are joining uh, us today. Um, I'd also like to start by uh, acknowledging the land from which I'm joining, which is the, uh, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people uh, here in Ottawa. Um, and I'd like to thank you to, uh, today to join, for joining us for an extraordinary effort and discussion around the efforts that have been deployed by industry, uh, by, re by the research community, by public health experts uh, and governments beyond to address what has been an unprecedented time with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as Janet mentioned, my name is Francis Biodeau. I'm the Associate Deputy Minister at the Department of ISAID. Um, as some of you may know, ISAID in partnership with Health Canada launched Canada's biomanufacturing and life science strategy in July, 2021. This for us represents a long-term vision to strengthen Canada's biomanufacturing and life science ecosystem so that it can better protect Canadians against future epidemics and pandemics. And for that reason, today's discussion is really important to us. Um, I think the pandemic has forced us to realign our thinking uh, and has invited what has been unprecedented levels of collaboration across Canada, but also globally. This has become central to our considerations going forward to address COVID-19 and to prepare for future health threats. Our panel today 
is represent, representative of this level of global co cooperation, both at the scientific level and across our healthcare communities and across governments. I'll start by introducing each of our panelists in the order, order they will be asked to speak. Uh, each panelist will then have approximately 10 minutes for introductory remarks. As Janet mentioned, we will have a Q&A session. We'll have about 25 minutes for a Q&A session at the end, and participants are invited to submit their questions. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Joanne Langley. Uh, Dr. Langley is a pediatric infectious disease physician in the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie University, uh, based at IWK Health and the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology. I'd also really like to extend my personal thanks to Dr. Langley for the pivotal role that she played during the pandemic as the co-chair of Canada's Vaccine Task Force. The advice of the Vaccine Task Force has been absolutely essential to our COVID-19 response. Our second speaker today will be Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Uh, he's the director of the Center for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, uh, Durban, and Caprisa Professor uh, of Global Health at Columbia University, New York. He's the chair of the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. Um, our third speaker today will be Dr. Nadine Caron. Uh, Dr. Caron is professor at UBC Northern Medical Program in the Department of Surgery, as well as senior scientist at Canada's Michael Smith Genome Science Center at BC Cancer. After Dr. Caron, we'll be inviting Dr. Stephen Hoffman uh, to speak. Dr. Hoffman is the Vice President of Data and Surveillance with the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Director of the WHO Collaborating Centre on Global Governance and Antimicrobial Resistance. And our final speaker today will be Dr. Uh, Reno Rapuli, who is the Chief Scientist and Head External R&D in JSK Vaccine uh, based in Siena, Italy, and Professor at, at the Imperial College and University of Siena. Um, before we begin, uh, I'll open the floor to our dis distinguished panelists, uh, as mentioned in turn, uh, for opening remarks, uh, approximately 10 minutes each, uh, and then enter into our, our broader uh, Q&As. And A's. And I'll turn the floor to Dr. Langley. As was mentioned, I had the opportunity to uh, serve on the Canada's COVID-19 vaccine uh, task force along with my co-chair, Dr. Mark, uh, Mr. Mark Livonen. And my thoughts today are my personal thoughts about this topic. I'm not speaking on behalf of the task force. Next slide. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I work in a vaccine research center and um, we uh, collaborate with industry as well as getting funding from CIHR and other um, non-industry sponsors. All of that money goes to uh, Dalhousie University, not to me, and I've also listed my uh, volunteer uh, work as well. Next slide, please. So uh, as the first speaker, I couldn't help but just acknowledge the tremendous suffering that has occurred to humanity uh, in the last couple of years. The loss of life, the orphan children, the long-term health consequences for those who have survived the infection and those who took care of them. This is um, something called in America, how could this happen? It's by artist Susan Brennan, Suzanne Brennan, and this was in the Armory Grounds in Washington with one flag for every death. And this is just America, uh, but we could say this about the whole world. How could this happen? And how can we prevent it from happening again? Next slide. Uh, this shows just the effect, not just on those who died, but on those who are left behind. And I want to just mention the post-COVID condition that we're trying to better understand and which may have impact for generations to come. Next slide. And just a word to say that it's not over yet. This is today's um, uh, John Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard. And you can see that we've had uh, um, over 6.5 million deaths um, over 600 uh, million total cases, and uh, it looks very successful there with that over 12 billion vaccines, but we'll I'll learn more about that during the, the whole symposium, I think. Uh, next slide, please. So what was the VTF? Why did we need it? 
The, the goal of the vaccine task force, which was created in June 2020, had this one overarching mission to provide advice to ministers in order to secure access for Canadians to safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. Now, looking back uh, then, we didn't have any to pick from on a shelf. There were no commercialized vaccines. So Canada, like many other countries, um, was in the position of looking at the uh, basic science of possible vaccine candidates, comparing them to other platforms and trying to pick which ones might be winners. So we had the uh, had a tripartite mission as it was, look at domestic vaccine candidates. Were there any in Canada? What were the international candidates? If there were international ones, could we partner them with Canadian industry to do some part of the supply chain, such as fill or finish or some of the clinical trials, some type of collaboration that would build Canadian capacity and use the resources we have. And then thirdly, to look at the whole biomanufacturing landscape. Uh, what is the status of the biomanufacturing uh, landscape? And that led to, uh, of course, the life sciences uh, and biomanufacturing strategy, which was a whole of government uh, response, I think that you'll hear about later. And next slide, please. So just a word to say, why did we need a vaccine task force? One might think, well, weren't there existing structures? And I think this speaks to not just Canada's situation, but the world's situation in terms of planning for emerging infectious diseases and seeing the, the planet as one ecosystem. So in Canada, uh, vaccine planning is divided between provinces and territories. Um, so we kind of have 13 different programs uh, across the provinces and territories. And the provinces and territories procure vaccines and decide how to implement them. We don't have a national vaccine program such as the UK or the US or Australia or a, a functioning vaccine registry. And so each province has a, a schedule. The National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, that's the international term. And the US, it would be ASIP. Um, in uh, other countries, it has other names. In Canada, it's called the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, N-A-C-I. And they would make recommendations. And their experience was in the vaccine types I have listed here. You can see that mRNA is not there. and. Um, so that was not something that any of us would have had experience with. Next slide, please. Uh, the other experience is planning for pandemics. And Canada's pandemic planning really began in, the, began in the 1980s with a first real paper plan in 1988. Um, the first real test of the plan was the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And in that, uh, a pandemic vaccine contract, which is a 10-year contract with GSK, uh, was uh, procured and that's what led to our rapid supply of vaccine. And we also um, had an antiviral stock, stockpile which was deployed. Next slide. So the work of the task force was with regard to domestic candidates and we had a framework that we, uh, a lens through which we looked at every potential um, proposal or uh, possibility in the country. Um, and that uh, included scientific and technical merit, project management merit, and the ability to contribute to advancing Canada's vaccine research and development sector. And that, of course, was a process that is still ongoing, um, and I'm abbreviating it very much here. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, pieces of work that was done with ISAID and uh, a number of vendors that helped uh, get this information was to look in every closet and under every carpet to find every um, part of the vaccine manufacturing value chain in Canada, right across from um, early vaccine development to bulk manufacture of vaccines, fill and finish, logistics and distribution, and so on. And so there was a snapshot at that time that informed the ability to assess capacity. And that uh, evaluation is ongoing. Next slide. Uh, and then there were international candidates. 
And ultimately, after going through that same rubric of valuation of each possible candidate based on meeting with the vaccine companies, getting having meetings with international experts, um, reviews of literature, uh, the various candidates were uh, proposed across these platforms and uh, procurements were made. Canada also participated in uh, the global sol solidarity effort of COVAX. Next slide. And COVAX was um, an effort to have a international, to have a global approach to vaccine procurement and distribution. And there are lots of things that went very well and lots of things that are to improve. I think it's important to recognize that international collaboration for dealing with health emergencies is really only a phenomenon of the last couple of centuries. Humans have been on the planet for 300,000 years. And the first time we had an international effort for peace was in 1899, um, when uh, there was the pre predecessor to the League of Nations. Um, at The Hague. So we don't have a lot of experience on working together as a planet. And that's, I think, is one of the things that we can build on for the future. Next slide. So this is the, the success story. UNICEF uh, puts out a dashboard of the success of the distribution of vaccines to the COVAX facility. You can see there are 40 vaccines approved for use. Um, 1.7 billion doses shipped through COVAX. Next slide. Uh, but you can see that vaccine distribution is unequal with Africa standing out here as not having an equal distribution of doses. Next slide. So my last two slides, what are we learning? This sufficient COVID-19 vaccine was secured for Canadians, but it was all from international procurements. Many Canadian projects at early stages of development were recognized and supported through various mechanisms, but as of today, none are ready for mass production. There has been up to $2 billion invested, and my colleagues from ICED can give us a lot more detail about that to make up this deficit. The deficit has been recognized, and now we have a better understanding of the landscape of Canadian manufacture and the needs that are ahead of us. We do need an approach, I would argue, though, that incorporates domestic capability and sustainability and recognition of our inherent interdependence and reciprocity with the other nations of the world. Because we can't keep, it's not feasible to keep Canada, a country of 37 million, in a sustained state of biomanufacturing readiness to produce all of the vaccines we needed for all the emerging infectious diseases. And last slide. I would argue that science is not the barrier, that we do need to consider um, our role within Canada and the world. What can we learn from COVAX as a prototype and how can we work towards uh, global approaches towards understanding vaccine safety, immunogenicity, efficacy and effective outcome measures and program goals so there isn't unnecessary duplication. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Langley. Um... I think that's a great way to start off our session. Uh, certainly the, the work of the task force has been um, central to Canada's response. Um, and your thoughts around international collaboration and how these moments uh, bring together and provide an opportunity to create collaboration internationally uh, it were, were really interesting to me. And I'd like to think further about how we seize the moment as we get into the Q's and A's. I'll now turn over uh, the, the conversation to Dr. Salim Abdul Karim, Dr. Karim. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. Well, it's my pleasant task to talk about what have we learned about science in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, let's plunge directly into it. I think for me, as we went into the first cases, I saw a whole new world of communication about science become available. Prime among those was the way in which we had daily communication. The World Health Organization held daily press briefings. 
in my own country, the minister would have a regular every day briefing on the number of cases, number of deaths. The president would have a uh, state of the nation address, which were called family meetings. So what we began to see is a level of openness and transparency that I have not seen in having worked on epidemics and pandemics for over 40 years. And that information has set a new bar for public transparency. We're not going back, I think, to a situation where the next pandemic will not have this level of communication. But what happens when information and evidence is required to develop policy? But at the same time, the scientific uncertainty is high. For example, in the early parts of 2020, there was very little known about COVID-19. And especially that's the time when policymakers want to hear, you know, what should we be doing? For example, questions like, is a lockdown necessary? How strict should it be? For how long do you do it? When should, when should you lift it? How should you lift it? So one of the things I did was I looked for what publications they were. And at the time, I found only three publications on lockdown in March 2020. And there was almost no information about any of these three questions. And so what we were having to do is in the midst of uncertainty to provide some guidance, acknowledging that we are in a position of high uncertainty. And by the way, those three articles, one was in the newspaper called The Guardian, and it was about swine flu and the role of uh, the lockdown in Mexico to contain swine flu. There was one article in the International Journal of Epidemiology that talked about how Sierra Leone used the lockdown to contain the Ebola epidemic there. And the third was this document, which was a handbook written by the doctors in Wuhan about their experiences with COVID-19 and they created this prevention and treatment handbook that talked about how they implemented the lockdown in China. And even now, these limited evidence, but there are some key questions. Will there be a new variant? Or will it be more severe? Will our vaccines be effective against it? There are just questions that come forward and we live in this period of uncertainty. But there are some things that are predictable. For example, in March of last year, I was asked, you know, when is the next wave? And uh, this journalist from Bloomberg kept questioning me and saying, you know, when, when is it going to happen? And so I let on that, you know, a very simple calculation takes you to December the 2nd, when is when we can expect to have the second, the, the fourth wave in South Africa, because it's a pretty standard uh, curve. And of course, what happened on, on the 2nd of December, South Africa passed the threshold for the fourth wave due to the Omicron uh, variant. And what happened next? Social media went crazy. On the 3rd of uh, December, everywhere it was. Professor Karim manufactured the virus in his laboratory and released it into South Africa. That's how he knew it was coming on the 2nd of December. In fact, there were several people fact-checking me. It just shows you the nature of the challenges that we face. And of course, we're having to provide scientific information to the public, advice to policymakers in this uncertainty. And so giving this kind of information in the midst of the uncertainty, always has its challenges. And in, in, even though you might, as a scientist, might feel uncertain, of course, Denzel, who got a PhD in the University of WhatsApp, or Tandy, who got uh, a PhD or MSc in the University of Google or YouTube or Facebook, they, of course, know all the answers. And so having to deal with that uh, information flow was always a big challenge. And one has to be very careful that you don't let the, your personal opinion and your own speculation masquerade as science, because it's very easy to do that. And you always have the know-it-alls. The Mr. Know-it-alls and what we call uh, in South Africa, you know, the Captain Hindsight knows all the answers in hindsight. And so we have to be careful in dealing with this kind of approach and staying true to the evidence. And we saw how truthfulness became a casualty in this pandemic. For example, in September of 2020, this uh, very famous article was quoted in Sky News and in EWN, 
that people in high density areas have generated immunity from previous exposure to the common cold viruses. Professor XXX believes that between 40 and 45% of the population already contracted the virus and we've reached the threshold for herd immunity. I mean, there's about five factual errors just in that one sentence. So one has to deal with that challenge of even among scientists conveying information that's not quite accurate. And of course, we had doctors themselves also talk about how, oh, this is just like the flu. You know, don't know what all the fuss is about. And these test results are all false positives. So we're having to deal with the casualty of truthfulness. And you have this this honesty challenge because in the midst of the pandemic, we had the infodemic, which led to the disinformation. And of course, when people are anxious and unclear, conspiracy theories become very important because they help explain the world and they identify who is to blame for your anxieties and your misfortunes. Because, you know, the scientists don't want to tell you who's actually causing the problem. And of course, the more powerful the person you blame, the more likely and more plausible it sounds. So, of course, Mr. Gates tended to be, uh, you know, at the receiving end of many of these things about how he was putting microchips in the vaccines and he created this virus just so that he could do that. And it's very hard because every time you challenge a falsehood or a conspiracy, it, it, the, the, it, it becomes even more reinforced in a way. And so you're dealing with a very difficult and subtle situation. Let me just conclude by saying that for me, one of the really interesting developments during COVID-19 was how science became empowering. You know, language and the use of scientific idiom, you know, is usually confined to the ivory towers. You know, bald-headed gentleman walking amidst the, the books in the library. But under COVID, everybody was talking about R naught, reproductive rate, about what's the prevalence, what's the mortality rate. And so the scientific evidence that was being shared empowered people, helped them to understand the virus, how to prevent it, and became the bulwark against the conspiracy theories and the fake news and the fear mongers. And so the pandemic was an opportunity to recalibrate this relationship between science and society, the way in which science came to the fore and new diagnostics and new treatments and, and, and vaccines in the midst of society's needs and urgent requirements for these tools. So let me end off with five key lessons I learned about providing scientific information. And the, probably the most and can summarize it with, you know, trust people with the hard truths. Don't hide the uncertainty. Don't convey uncertainty as if you know what's going on. And so you have to provide the available evidence in that way. Don't patronize people. Convey information with clarity on what the facts are and what are the conjectures. What are you extrapolating and what do you know? Because what you know is actually very little. And do not cherry pick the evidence to suit your viewpoint. Just explain where science has differing results and is not yet settled, but be forward-looking. Map out options for the future, map out what you know, so that you can relieve anxiety that we have some idea of what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. And let people make up their own mind in trying to convey information about how to act. And I was asked by the president to do a national televised uh, scientific presentation. And in all of this, I had to say to people, Yes, this is going to come to us. We are all going to get uh, exposed in some way, or most of us are going to get exposed in some way, and some of us are going to get infected. Fortunately, we uh, know that we have tools to protect us from getting infected. So on that note, thank you very much. I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor abdul Karim. Um, the issues of um, legitimacy, public trust, uh, disinformations are, are one that uh, have been a particular focus of, of my department and, and are very timely, uh, time, timely issues. But I think it's fair to say that never are they more important and, and uh, scientific evidence and legitimacy more important than in times of pandemic or in times where we're asking the population to make sacrifices and to take action for the collective good. Uh, so very insightful remarks. Thank you for that. We'll now ask Dr. Nadine Caron, Caron to, to make her remarks. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Chimigwich. It is an honor to be on this panel, and I want to thank the Gardner Foundation and my fellow panelists for this opportunity. I'm a member of the Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation, and I'm currently joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam peoples. As an Indigenous mother, sister, daughter, physician, researcher, I thought I would start off by reminding all of us, including myself, that statistics, numbers, the epidemiological modeling are all based on people, individuals who make up families, families who make up communities, and each individual in a numerator or denominator or other places in those fancy statistics that always get me confused, each individual has a story. And I think this is important because stories are powerful teachers. In surgery, sometimes we call stories cases because then we can sound more clinical, like cases that we present at morbidity and mortality rounds. Or in the academic centers, we call cases in medicine um, so that we can basically sound more academic, case-based learning in medical school curriculum, or case studies when we're talking about publications in journals. But we also have know that stories can have qualitative data in the research space. So we can use thematic analysis and software tools like in vivo to turn stories and vignettes into themes and data. We need stories to accompany these research results because try sending out a media release with an upcoming research publication if it's not connected to a research participant or person or community or population that will benefit, hopefully, from that research study. Stories provide context, it provides rationale, provide, provides reason. And I love this quote by an Indigenous author that quite simply says that the truth about stories is that that's all we are. So I wanna start off by telling you about a story about Anne. Anne is First Nations and from a remote reserve in Northern BC. She was brought in from her home in this outlying community and was admitted. She was incredibly upset to be in this foreign place a building of bricks and mortar. She felt sick to her stomach with dread. People were taking care of her, but they were telling her that her family couldn't be with her and her best friend, her sister, could not be at her bedside that night. There was no one that spoke her language, her native language. Those who came to check on her were increasingly telling her, speak English, speak English. But as she became more stressed, her inability to do so increased. She was struggling, but she was trying to trust in their authority and in the process. She had no cell phone or way to communicate with her loved ones outside of this building. She had no idea what was in store for her. She felt panic rising with it and her breathing became labored as if she was having a panic attack. But she was told it was in her best interest that this was what the government experts knew would work. Now, Anne was known in her community for her beautiful long braided hair, her smile and her infectious laugh, which would make everyone around her want to join in. But now she had no control. She didn't want to be here. She was scared to leave, but perhaps more petrified to stay. They took away her belongings, including her clothes, and gave her this cheap cotton gown to wear instead, stripping her of her dignity. They put her in a room and took away her privacy with others who seemed as scared as she did. Ah, I forgot. Did I tell you that Anne was six years old and about to spend her first night in a residential school? Now, Fast forward 72 years, Anne is now an elder, a knowledge keeper in her community and walking through a hospital, bricks and mortar, a government institution for healthcare in this pandemic. How similar do you think the language and the terminology of this rational science-based public health recommendations would sound to an Indian residential school survivor in our country during the emerging and during the, the pandemic? Now, these public health measures as an indigenous physician, indigenous surgeon in these communities, I understood them and I supported them, but there were definitely unintended consequences to these. I mean, Dr. Martin and myself wrote this article early on in the pandemic, and we said that while we were putting on masks as healthcare providers, COVID-19 was unmasking cracks in our Canadian healthcare system. We heard, all of us heard the recommendations, the mandates, the regulations, social distancing, masks, vaccine, vaccine passports, quarantines, testings, and on and on. We certainly heard statistics and numbers, delays and cancellations of operations, other medical procedures, appointments, both in the hospital and outside of the hospital. We heard about delays and cancellations. As a surgical oncologist, I heard it. Cancer screening can uh, was canceled, delayed, or postponed so that hundreds, actually thousands of Canadians were 
following these public health recommendations and staying isolated or walking along isolated beaches or sidewalks, not even aware of the cancer that they were harboring in their body because the mammogram or the colonoscopy or the pap smears were delayed or canceled. This mattered. They were associated with stories, stories about the illness, stories about the complications of the treatment or the lack of treatment, or of course, the deaths. But what I heard as an Indigenous physician in Indigenous communities, talking to First Nation elders, knowledge keepers, el uh, chiefs, was the anxiety and the fear of being alone in a hospital as loved ones couldn't accompany you to tests, waiting rooms in where you're waiting for procedures or waiting to find out the answers to those tests, or you would have a surgery and there'd be no one there to be with you when you're recovering from this. Now this was important and this was not unique to indigenous peoples at all. It was scary for all Canadians, for all people on this planet, definitely. But think about it. For many indigenous peoples and communities in Canada, these words, these phrases, they were not new. Sanitize, isolate, quarantine, government rules, in your best interest, stay in your region, surveillance. All of a sudden now, think about Anne. It may have actually made their perceptions of hospitals, healthcare providers, institutions, research and government policies, even worse. Don't forget the legacies of residential schools, TB sanatoriums, Indian hospitals, and the history of science and experimentation that was done then. Remember the reserves and papers and documentations required for travel to leave reserves. Now you needed documentation to get on WestJet or Air Canada, and of course, the government policies. Today's versions of all of this triggered yesterday's memories in patients and family members. And during this pandemic then, the necessity for cultural safety and humility in our society and in our healthcare system was certainly magnified. Ah, but I'm located here in, in British Columbia and we had this perfect storm. It wasn't new at all, but it certainly all came to the forefront. In fact, we had a provincial inquiry into indigenous specific racism in our healthcare system in our province. And that was released in November, 2020. Of course, the pandemic was declared earlier that year. And then about four years prior to the pandemic, the toxic drug public health emergency was declared by our provincial government. Now, the toxic drug crisis, all of a sudden, Bonnie Henry, a great leader in our province, did acknowledge the increase in overdose deaths amongst Indigenous peoples in BC, certainly, once again, disproportionately represented uh, in the number of incidents of uh, toxic drug overdoses and the deaths, as you can see on the bottom right, the first six months of 2020, and then the, the first six months of 2021, seeing not only the, the disproportionate representation of First Nations in these numbers, but the increase as COVID uh, increased. The First Nations Health Authority statement of societal consequences demonstrated that Indigenous peoples have been disproportionately affected not only by COVID-19 numbers in terms of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, and the impact of uh, uh, vaccines, as well as the public health measures taken to respond to it, which have reinforced these existing inequities, discrimination, and racism in our healthcare system. And it's so hard to separate the past from the present and all of these uh, entities that went into this perfect storm. Experiences within the healthcare system from the past would be carried into the healthcare system currently. Exacerbation of comorbidities. If you look at any health statistic, pretty much if I was a betting person, I would say that First Nations or Métis or Inuit would fare less well. The exacerbation of the social determinants of health and the disparities there. Even if someone wanted to follow these public health recommendations to the T, it's really hard to self-isolate it if you live in crowded housing when you have entities such as socioeconomic disparities and otherwise. Vaccine hesitancy can be explained when you understand the trust in the healthcare system. Experiences with science, of course, we talked about. And if we're learning about what, we're, what did we learn from COVID-19, perhaps going back to the H1N1 influenza may shed some light into what indigenous peoples were carrying into this pandemic. There was consistent evidence indicating back in 2009 that First Nations people were in particular at increased risk for severe outcomes for H1N1 influenza. But just weeks, actually days, after the WHO declared an emergency, or sorry, a pandemic, alcohol-based sanitizers were actually delayed being shipped out because of the alcohol content and the concern of abuse for First Nations people in these communities that were isolated and away from tertiary care. And then a couple months later, all of a sudden, in these same communities or similar communities, reserves, we're waiting for these ongoing uh, 
uh, health uh, and uh, medical uh, contents, and they received body bags instead. This was the stuff that I was hearing over in British Columbia when I was just starting out my career. Now, priorities and perspectives of Indigenous peoples, we start to hear a lot of terminology that has been added to the same thing as surveillance and isolation and quarantine and uh, testing. But we've heard things like Indigenous rights, self-governance, data sovereignty, Indigenous wisdom and methodologies. These things are also becoming increasingly out there in the news, like Salim said. In Canada, we're starting to hear this more and more. And you've caught me on an optimistic day. I think that is a good thing. So as we approach our second National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, perhaps we can consider these questions from the panel about the COVID pandemic. Where are we now? What did we learn? What next? Perhaps on December 30th, we can even look at it from a broader perspective. But I think overall, these are hard questions, hard questions. And I'll end with one final quote. I love this one because questions you cannot answer are usually far better for you than answers you cannot question. And so thank you to the Gerner Foundation for having an Indigenous perspective on this panel, because I think for a long time, we've been told that we cannot question the answers. And now I love the fact that as a country, I think we are. Chi miigwech. Well, thank you, Dr. Kale. And what a, what a powerful reminder that while numbers are important, they're only a portion of the story, and that there, there are real people and real communities behind uh, the numbers. Um, and uh, I think a, a really eye-opening uh, thoughts around how the history and the lived realities of Indigenous people will shape how they are um, how they are experience the pandemic and how they experience their interactions uh, with some with institutions that are part of our, our daily lives. Uh, so thank you for that. I'll now ask uh, Dr. Stephen Huffman for his introduction, introductory remarks. Merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici. Et merci beaucoup à la Fondation Gardner pour cette opportunité. I'm really uh, delighted to be here um, to talk about how we can achieve a world-class health data system in Canada. I'll be talking about the Canadian context, but for those uh, outside of Canada, the journey that uh, countries and systems and jurisdictions are making around the world is a similar one, one that I think um, we can all be learning from each other. I think I'm going to start with highlighting that uh, when it comes to a health data system and the kind of system that we need for our country and across all jurisdictions in the world, uh, are really pointing to two, or two reasons why we need to be thinking of how we move forward. The first is more obvious and personal. Uh, I think all of us uh, as patients at one point in time in our lives uh, want to have access to the health information about us, the health information that we need in order to make informed decisions. And we want our clinicians, our carers, also to have full access to the health data that they need in order to provide the care for us when we need it. The second reason though I'll point to is around public health. And for this, this is something that the pandemic in particular has brought to a fore and really highlights um, the opportunity that we have to take from an experience that was collectively terrible, an experience that cost too many lives, but one that really shone a light on some lessons learned that we need to take forward in the future. I have to say when it comes to data, I've been working in this space my entire career, uh, but what's also clear is that there has not been the kind of attention on data systems like there is right now and like what the pandemic uh, revealed. I'm gonna start just with one uh, very simple example related to vaccine uh, deployments across our country. And of course, I've heard similar stories across jurisdictions outside of Canada. The first, of course, is this virus uh, was first detected a year later through the power of science, we have a vaccine. One of the early decisions facing governments and health authorities around the world is how to effectively deploy it within their jurisdictions. And so within a jurisdiction in the Canadian context, uh, vaccines were primarily deployed and prioritized on the basis of age segmentation, which made good sense for lots of good reasons. But one thing that was detected early on is that there were greater people, um, uh, of people from different races were showing up in hospitals with COVID-19 
in different numbers and its different proportions of the Canadian population, already an early warning signal of inequities. Once we then started to link vaccination data and COVID-19 hospitalizations with geography, we started to be able to develop maps of the kind that you see on the slide in the top right-hand corner. And in those maps, you can see that uh, there is an inequitable distribution of vaccination, not only, of course, globally in between countries, as was earlier described, but also even within, in this case, the city of Toronto, as that map shows, uh, great inequities. And so as a result, it was data and it was insights once generated like that in the maps that then allowed, in this case, um, Toronto Public Health and the government of Ontario to be working with community organizations to figure out different modes of how we scale up uh, vaccination, working with communities, going into neighborhoods, making it easy for people who lived in areas that did have less access to vaccination to have greater access. It's a small example, but one that's obviously very important, very personal, but it is resonant across this whole pandemic and the kind of newspaper headlines that I think we all might have seen, again, no matter what jurisdiction we live in. Here are just some examples, uh, clips from uh, online, different newspapers that are suddenly bringing the issues that for those of us who are working in data for our whole careers, bringing it to the fore and causing conversations about our data systems across every kitchen table across the land to the highest political offices, including the prime minister's office. And so the key then is how do we make use of this attention to data, recognizing that data saves lives, recognizing that without data, it's impossible to provide appropriate health care. It's impossible to provide the kind of precision public health that public health leaders want to be able to provide. This is an opportunity for us to take stock of those lessons and work towards a world-class health data system uh, that I think we would all like to see. I think one of the challenges when it comes to data is that it's so ubiquitous. It's like electricity in the sense that um, we just expect our electricity to work every time we plug in our laptops, we plug in our lights, uh, and we don't really think much about it until we have a big power outage. And then suddenly pictures like these and questions about the infrastructure that's behind those power outlets in our walls suddenly come to the fore and are raising important questions. And so with that, uh, I think it's clear we need to be thinking more about that infrastructure and not just the power lines or the data pipes that connect us, but also how do we regulate the quality of data so that it's interoperable. Noting I'm short on time, I'll just quickly say, of course, there's an international dimension of this too. And that if we just look at the data, here's a study that looked at the lag that it takes for um, in Canada to report uh, genomic uh, sequencing of uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses, flagging that we, during the pandemic, were close to the bottom in terms of the speed in which we reported those genome sequences to international databases. Uh, we're coming after China and right after Argentina in this long list. And then so right now we feel the pains of this system, data are duplicated, costs are increased, privacy risks are increased, insights are slow. A lot of this though is by design. This is how our data systems have been built over time. And so what we see is that we have data as protected as possible and only open as necessary. And so I think what we need to do is draw lessons from other sectors like the banking sector, uh, like many Canadians and people around the world, I love just being able to hop on my smartphone, access all of my financial data, transact and do what I need to do. Of course, that goes in evolution and in healthcare and public health, we're seeing that too. But we seem to be in some places and in some contexts stuck with the fax machine. And I know there was uh, on Twitter and other social media, big campaigns about axing the fax. Uh, and of course, lots of effort and a huge investment to do it. But we need to mobilize that faster because of course, lives are at stake. Let me just end by uh, highlighting that um, what's next ideally would be systems where data is secure, where costs are fewer, privacy risks are decreased, insights are near real time, actions granular, innovations flourishing. Uh, and ultimately we need to get to a system where data are as open as possible, and of course, as protected as necessary, but one where we see data as an asset, one where we leverage it to save lives. All of us are involved in this. Looking forward to the conversation about it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Um, I think 
effective use of data is certainly one of the <laughs> challenges of our times and um, certainly applies in the context of healthcare, certainly applies in the context of a pandemic. Um, but it's often, as you mentioned, uh, superimposed or contrasted with uh, issues around data ownership, around data privacy, around data monetization, and how that plays into the system. And as we get into the conversation, I will be actually curious to hear from you um, whether you feel that the current pandemic, the insights and the realization around the potential of data to address public health issues has changed the mindset or has shifted uh, the views and the balance between some of these elements that we who work in public <laughs> policy sectors strive to be able to engage, but also think about what the, what the appropriate balance is, as well as what the public acceptance is. So thank you for that. And we will be now t turning to Dr. Uh, Reno Rapuli for, for his opening remarks. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this today. Today, uh, basically, I'm going to talk to you about the miracle of making COVID vaccines. And uh, at the same time, uh, the, what I, the economic implications of that, what I call the uh, trillion dollar gap uh, about uh, basically having the vaccine. The, now, the miracle to make vaccines is because in this, in, usually to make vaccines takes 10, 15 years. And in this case, we were able to make vaccines in 10 months. So uh, the first thing I'll try to address is why we are able to make vaccines so fast. So the, uh, basically the reason, uh, uh, basically why we uh, were able to make vaccines so fast was probably because in this case, we were able to transition from what I call analog vaccines to digital vaccines. Uh, analog vaccines are the vaccines we've been using so far, where we take viruses, bacteria, uh, parasites, and then we grow them and we uh, inactivate them and we inject them, or we attenuate them and we inject them real virus, we need real, real bacteria in order to make vaccines. That's the way we've been making vaccines so far. In this case, in the, uh, in the case of COVID, uh, we transitioned to what I call digital vaccines because basically we didn't need to isolate the virus, but we use the sequence of the genome of the virus, which was done in China and was basically shipped worldwide at the speed of light uh, by internet, and the sequence ended up in computers, the vaccines were designed, and then the computers basically provided information how to make vaccines that uh, uh, to a robotic station or to laboratories were able to make the vaccines out of that. And in the case of RNA vaccines, the vaccines were not made by viruses or pieces of virus, but the vaccine contained the information to make vaccines. Uh, which is the RNA. So that's basically one of the reasons. One of the reasons is we went so fast is was because the technology allowed us to move from analog vaccines to digital vaccines. So what happened? Basically on January 10, 10, 10 2020, the Chinese Center for Disease Control uh, put the sequence of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus into the internet. Uh, the sequence was downloaded by 350 laboratories worldwide. And all these laboratories without seeing the virus were able to make a synthetic gene in the laboratory. And then they used the synthetic gene uh, to make vaccines. And they never seen the virus at that point. And how was the synthetic gene uh, used? The first use was to make fully synthetic vaccines, which are RNA vaccines. Basically, the synthetic gene was used to make a synthetic RNA and the synthetic RNA very quickly moving to clinical trials in 66 days. 
Other people use the synthetic gene to uh, engineer an adenovirus, mostly adenovirus, viral vector, uh, and then they grow the viral vector containing the gene for the vaccine, and then they use that, uh, grow the vector, the virus, and they uh, use that in, in clinical trials. And that was took a little bit longer because they had to grow the virus took three months. Others took a more conventional approach, started from the synthetic gene. They engineer uh, mammalian cells like C Chinese hamster ovary cells, tobacco cells, and that was done by Medicago in Canada or insect cells by many other companies. Then they had to grow the cells, purify the spike protein uh, to make uh, add together with an adjuvant, and then uh, basically uh, formulation. This is the more conventional, takes longer, but in six months, they were all in the clinical trials. This was early 2020. And as soon as these vaccines were in clinical trials, immediately we realized that the viral vectors, the adenovirus were immunogenic, but had less immunogenicity than the RNA vaccines, which are much better. And uh, also the uh, vaccines made the proteins plus adjuvants are also very good. Um, and very quickly, we understood that the uh, RNA vaccines the, and the vaccines made by proteins plus adjuvants were extremely efficacious, 95% while the viral vectors were also efficacious, but a little bit lower, efficacy 60, 90%. The amazing thing was that all these vaccines were at the different efficacy against infection, but they all had a very high efficacy against uh, severe disease. So uh, that's the reason why we went so fast. Uh, uh, from the technical point of view. But there was another reason, extremely important to move, to make vaccines so fast, which was the investment uh, made by the public sector. In order to understand that, you need to understand how we make vaccines in vaccine companies. When we make vaccines, usually we, uh, we first do the discovery and that takes uh, some time. And then once we have a successful discovery, we go into phase one clinical trials. And then once we have uh, done a phase one clinical trial successful, we move into phase two. Once this is successful, we move into phase three and we build a manufacturing plant. And all this process takes 10, 20 years. The reason we do that sequentially, one step after the other is because Making a vaccine is takes at least a billion dollars, or uh, and uh, we we will not build a manufacturing plant. and will not spend a lot of money unless we know that the phases before are uh, are successful. Now, in this particular case, when the pandemic came early 2020, the public sector, basically governments. Uh, put together quite a lot of money, more than 15 billion. 12.5 came from the United States, the Warp Speed Program. And basically the public sector came to manufacturers like us and they said, look, I know that you usually make vaccines by sequentially, you first do discovery, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And the reason you do that is because you cannot afford in the private sector a financial risk of uh, throwing away a billion if the vaccine doesn't work. Uh, but the public sector said to us in the companies, look, this time we have an emergency. Me, I, the public sector, I'm going to take the financial risk. Here is a billion for company A, two billions for company B, 0.5 billion for company three, C. And so I'm gonna take the financial risk, but I would like you to do uh, vaccine development the following way. Well, you start discovery, and I know that discovery could take, I mean, maybe uh, six months, maybe nine months. Don't worry. As soon as you have the first thing that seems to work in the lab, move to phase one. And I know that phase one could take 18 months, sometimes more, but as soon as you have data on safety immunogenicity, move to phase two. And then I know phase two sometimes takes two years, sometimes 2.5 years. But as soon as you have data on safety, immunogenicity, and the dose that's necessary, move to phase three. And by the way, start immediately to make a manufacturing plant. 
I know that if vaccine doesn't work, we will not use it, but I don't wanna be at the end of the cycle if we have a vaccine and we don't have a manufacturing plant. So basically the uh, public sector took the financial risk and we did things in parallel and vaccines were developed in 10 months. Uh, and you know, since we went so fast, many people in the public said, well, you went so fast, for sure you skipped, so you, you went too fast and the, you don't know about the safety and the efficacy. And as you can see, we in doing in vaccines so fast, we went, uh, we basically took a financial risk, but we not take any risk in the steps that are necessary to determine the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. So, so we went fast and the, uh, the thanks to the risk, the financial risk that was taken by the public sector. Um, I was discussing this slide with uh, a Nobel Prize in uh, economics. And I was telling him, oh, look at this, uh, the public sector really spent a lot of money. And uh, re really that was very important to go fast. And he asked me, this is a, a Nobel Prize in economics, he said, do you really think it's a lot of money? I said, oh yes, 15 billion is a lot of money. He said, do you know how long it took to repay that investment? And I was thinking, I had no idea. And he says, well, 12 hours. Anticipating the, vac the vaccines by 12 hours was enough to repay the investment of 15 billion because at that time, the global economy was burning 500 billion every month. So that gives some perspective, basically how important is the economic factor in addition to the technical factor to move fast. Now, following that, I started to work with other uh, uh, economists uh, like David Bloom and Harvard and others. And that's we look at the investment was done by the public sector before the pandemic was pretty low. During the pandemic was a little bit more. Today is a little bit more, but we really try to calculate what would be really necessary. Uh, what would be the global investment necessary to prepare for a future pandemic? And we came up with the idea that we need at least 600 billion, which is basically, that's why we uh, basically call, uh, we in, entitled our publication, there is a, a trillion dollar vaccine gap if we want to be ready for future pandemics. Uh, that's technical and economical reason why we went so fast. So what happened when the vaccines were ready? December, 2020, we had a vaccine license. We thought we were done with the pandemic, we are very happy, but immediately we realized that the efficacy was going down, decreasing very rapidly. So what was going on? And people started to say, oh, the vaccines don't last, the RNA vaccines are not given long, Term immunity was going on. And my view is that what was going on that we had basically forgotten the immunology. Now, in order to understand what was going on, I went back uh, to this curve that is basically taken from a textbook of immunology in 1970. And basically this tells us that once you either immunize with two, one or two doses of vaccines, or you get an infection, you get a primary immune response and the antibody levels go up and they come down. Then six months, eight months later, you add, or 10 years later, you basically uh, give another vaccination or you are infected again. Now you have a secondary response. At this time, the, uh, the memory allows you to have a, a very strong uh, response, goes very high and then comes down, but never got, goes down to the level after the primary immunization. So how is this going to explain what happens? Basically it explains the fact that uh, after the initial two doses, we were protected, but then things went down. And then uh, with the third dose of the booster vaccine, we are get much, much protection. But unfortunately, things were complicated by the emergence of variants. Initially, we vaccinated with Wuhan. For Wuhan, it was necessary a very low levels of antibodies were enough to protect. Probably for Wuhan, we had a vaccine which was going to last uh, for the entire life. But then we got several mm, variants. One of them was beta. For beta, we needed 12 times more antibodies than for Wuhan. 
And so basically for beta, the primary immunization was only good at the very beginning, at the top of the immunization, but not, not later. And then we got Omicron. Omicron requires 40 times more antibodies to be protected. So basically primary immunization doesn't do anything. Uh, the booster, the third dose protects you from infection uh, for a very short period of time, three, four months, and then you are susceptible again. And that I think is what happens basically uh, what we see every day. That's the reason why uh, the vaccines uh, don't protect from infection, even if you, uh, or they protect from infection for only a short period of time. So why the vaccines protect from severe disease? Well, in order to understand that, you need to understand that the, in order to protect from severe disease, we need a lot of antibodies in the serum and in the lungs. Now, here you see in, in blue, the antibody levels in the serum and the lungs, very high uh, antibody titers. And that will protect from severe disease, that will protect from um, long COVID. However, to protect from infection, you need a lot of antibodies in the nose, and that is in the yellow. So in the nose, we have approximately 1% of the antibodies that you have in the blood. So the, in the nose, we got these antibodies that go up and go down very quickly. And they also, uh, when you give a boost, they go up and they go down quickly. So basically, in, in the nose, uh, we have very little of antibodies, 1% of the ones you have in the serum. That's why we can be infected. The virus can grow in the nose because the antibodies go down very quickly. At the same time, once the antibodies are gone down in the nose, you still have a lot of antibodies in the lung and in the uh, blood, and those will protect from severe infection. So I think this very simple explanation of the immunology, the way we know it, tries to explain uh, why we are still, uh, in spite of vaccination, we are uh, still infected, but we don't get severe disease. Uh, <clears throat> in conclusion, I. I tried to tell you two things. Why we went very fast in making uh, in, in making vaccines, and why we uh, the vaccines work against severe disease, but they don't work well for for protecting from from infection. These are my final considerations. We are vulnerable to emerging infections. They kill millions of people. They cause massive economic losses. In research, we should continue basically to find new solutions. We need to try to buy ahead of viruses. And if you want to protect from infection, we need to, the vaccines that we have today are not good enough be, because they protect only for a few months. We need probably new technology like mucosal vaccines. So we need to invest more. I uh, also want to share with you the importance of the investment in the public sector in going fast. Uh, and the fact that the 12.5 billion were uh, spent by the US government basically were repaid by, back, uh, by anticipating vaccination by 12 hours. Um, and uh, remind that, I mean, if you really want to have full development of a vaccine like has been done by, uh, for COVID, you need not 1 billion, you need 34 billion. And therefore, we still have a long gap, which I call the dollar, a trillion dollar gap, if you really want to be prepared for a future pandemic. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rupuli. And we're about to enter into the uh, into the Q and A session of our of our discussion. So um, I'd like to remind people that they can uh, submit questions uh, through through the Q and A function, uh, and we will be relaying it to to our speakers. Um, just reflecting on uh, Dr. Rupuli's intervention, as somebody who works with the with the public purse, uh, a trillion dollar gap is is certainly. Uh, a, a, a large amount, and as we enter into the conversation, I will be curious about your thoughts around um, the sustainability to maintain uh, public will uh, and the role of the public sector and government versus the academic sector and the private sector in helping to fill that gap and how we work together in that space. But maybe as a, as as we uh, wait for con for questions from the audience, um, I'll start with a, a more general conversation and ask people to to raise their hand to weigh in. Um, and 
the first question is is actually a fairly simple question, but you've all touched it in different ways. And do you feel we are now more ready for the next pandemic than we were before? And what should we make sure we do, or what do we need to focus on to make sure uh, that we are more ready for the next time? And um, happy to sort of touch on it from the data side, from uh, the communities, for example, the indigenous community side, uh, from, from the vaccine side, uh, but we'll ask, um, any of you uh, to start us to start us off in the conversation. And um, maybe Dr. Hoffman, we'll start with you. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Francis. Thanks so much. I am. Um, so it's such an important question. I think in some respects, yes, in some respects, no. So um, I think um, you know, for many of us, um, I mean, I've been um, I've been in the data space uh, my whole career, but uh, also um, a lot of my own previous work has focused on on pandemics and infectious disease issues. Um, there were a lot of people for a long time um, raising uh, alarm bells about uh, that next inevitable pandemic. Uh, I mean, it wasn't too long ago we cel celebrated the um, or marked rather the uh, 100 year anniversary of the Spanish influenza pandemic. Um, and the many, many lives uh, that were lost during that um, experience uh, over 100 years ago. So I think in some respects, um, the experience, the terrible experience that we've all collectively gone through over these last uh, more than two years um, hardens us and makes us more resilient and aware of future kind of threats. I guess though, um, I do, it does raise a question of to what extent have we been able around the world to implement quickly kind of changes that the COVID-19 pandemic might uh, inspire. I think, for example, looking at the monkeypox um, outbreak happening right now gives us a bit of an early warning that um, our systems are not, globally, are not where they need to be uh, and opportunities for further improvement. Uh, I mean, again, uh, a lot of the, from a data perspective, a lot of the early challenges that we faced with the COVID-19 pandemic are being experienced again with uh, monkeypox outbreak. But of course it doesn't end with monkeypox. Uh, there's many, there's, there's what's coming next and such. And so public health needs to be ready for multiple, multiple crises simultaneously happening that are increasingly complex. Are we there globally? We're not there. Lots of opportunity for improvement. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. And maybe I'll turn to um, Dr. Langley and sort of touching on that theme, but also just reflecting on the fact that we didn't have the, uh, domestic capacity for developing our own vaccines uh, pre-pandemic. Um, how do you feel about our capacity to, to build that capacity and how important is it to have the domestic capacity into the future? Dr. Langley? No, thank you, Francis. And wow, what a wonderful set of, uh, of talks. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so I think we're better off, but we're definitely not ready. <laughs> and I think that getting to a state of readiness will require sacrifice and incorporating lessons into behavior change. And not just sacrifice in the sense of, you know, the painful idea of sacrifice, but the transforming part of sacrifice. For example, the data um, presentation that Dr. Hoffman did you know, we have to give something on what we think is privacy to get to the point where we can share data. That transforms, there's a lot of change that would go with that, but we just have to commit to it. Otherwise, we're just going to be last for the next pandemic. Um, I think in terms of domestic capacity, there are many brilliant minds in Canada. There's a lot that Canada can contribute. And I made the point about we can build nationally within our own borders, but I really don't think it's realistic that we could ever be in a state that we could make all the vaccines we'd need for a new um, threat or be able to fund it. You know, the at-risk funding that, that um, Dr. Rapoli described. So um, I think we're going to have a stronger system. I, the, there's been a lot of investment from the federal government and, um, I really think a lot of people would like to see what the mission control will be because there's so much development in so many places. We need to think about how we're coordinating it, how we're making sure that um, the efforts will work together, even though you'll have different um, research foci that will be uh, pursued. There does need to be some kind of coordination. Um, and 
and what we can do to to make the world think that we are one place and we need to work on this together. Thank you, Dr. Langley. Maybe Dr. Rapuli, turning to you, um, but also reflecting not only on are we or are we readier, but perhaps around issues of partnership and perhaps around issues of um, how do we get ahead of the new variant? Well, that's um, that's a wonderful question. I mean, the clearly what you have done has been a fantastic miracle of science, basically to develop the vaccines that we have. But and the I mean, the vaccines that we have basically saved twenty million deaths. Uh, and the, I mean, they are fantastic. They allow us to have in-person meetings now, um, and and basically to have almost a normal life. On the other hand, we know that the vaccines that we have are not the ones that we need today. We would love to have vaccines that will prevent uh, infection and transmission, uh, but the vaccines that we have are not going to do that. So we need mucosal vaccines. Um, that requires big investment in research and development. And because of vaccines we've been discussing in the scientific community since 1980s, basically, but we never invested them on them because the systemic vaccines, they work so far. Uh, and so we'll need, we'll need to, to do that. So there are a lot of things we need to do. We need to, if we really want to be ahead of the virus, we need to have continue to do research and uh, implement new technologies and and continue basically to discover it and, and develop new 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 platform for vaccinations. Thank you. That's that's great. Um, maybe I'll turn to um, Dr. Carol next. And um, you ended your your um, initial remarks on a note of hope. Um, and um, so I guess question to you: Are we um, more ready for the future and what should we prioritize? How do we perhaps think about it engaging with indigenous communities or how do we um, do better than we did this time the next time? So to you, Dr. Kell. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, similar to some of what the other panelists are saying, I think we've learned a lot and I think we're definitely in a different position from my perspective for indigenous peoples as well. Uh, I, uh, I'm really fortunate to be in British Columbia where we have the First Nations Health Authority, uh, which is unique in the fact that it has a provincial wide health authority for First Nations people. Uh, and it has the transfer of that uh, level of control from the federal government in partnership with the federal government and provincial government to provide health care for First Nations, directed by First Nations with First Nations priori priorities. And so the First Nations Health Authority was very well uh, established, ready to go with respect to everything from like data to be able to provide it for communities. Uh, specific to uh, the communities in terms of hospitalizations, positive tests, uh, all of the, those elements of it, um, and ensuring that we had the, the representation at the provincial level and, and ultimately at the federal level. Um, what can we do that's different? I think a lot of those terms that I was talking about um, are becoming more common. I'm just taking some time off uh, a research meeting right now where we're, it's called a, a project called Silent Genomes, where we're actually addressing the paucity of Indigenous genomic data in a global level and, uh, and figuring out how we can fill that space and provide solutions in Canada. Um, when it comes to data sovereignty, uh, recognizing that there is, uh, there's so much power in data. Steven's here, he has way more expertise in this area than me and Joanne on my screen is on the other side of me. I feel overwhelmed by this incredible like IQ that I'm being squished with, but at the same point, um, there's something to do with power of data, but it can't be at the expense of control or ownership of it. Uh, I think it's how it's used and how, making sure that the people who own the data actually have the, the power to determine how it's used, who it's used by, why it's used, and having Indigenous people part of the solutions. I think what became, became evident was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, Indigenous communities and leaders actually took things into their own hands, which is why for the longest time, actually Indigenous particularly for stations, we're pretty doing fairly well at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the stats that you would have expected were turned on its head, but ultimately, you know, with the pandemic, um, those statistics turns back to the disparities we see repeatedly in the country. Lots of room for optimism, 
um, but during, certainly not putting down my guard. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. I'm going to turn to Dr. Abdul Karim in a moment. But after that, I encourage uh, panelists to use the raise hand function. If you want to follow up on anything that was said by any of your fellow panelists, feel free to pose questions, feel free to react to things that were said. So Dr. Abdul Karim, I guess, bottom line, same question to you is, are we more ready? But you've, you've spoken a lot about the importance of communications related to the trust in institutions and how you communicate out in the context of a pandemic. Um, you talked about some of the, some of the lessons learned. Um, do you feel that, uh, trust in institutions uh, has increased, do you feel that we are in a better position uh, to, to be able to engage with our citizens should there be another pandemic? It's to you. Yes, thank you very much, Francis. Let me just say it is terrific to hear the wonderful presentations from all of my colleagues in this panel. I think we have been um, uh, grappling with and understanding the importance of context. So the same pandemic, that the same virus that's spreading in the US in the context of a highly polarized society, that the introduction of masks becomes a political statement. Whereas in South Africa, when we were debating masks long before it was recommended by the World Health Organization, we decided that we should proceed with it. And so masks became a way of helping the person next to you because we argue that masks may not help you personally, but at least it will reduce the amount of virus if you happen to be asymptomatically positive. And so you have a sense of the importance of protecting your fellow humans. This, this notion that no one is safe until we are all safe, that we have a shared responsibility in dealing with this problem. And so this, this, this building of trust is very much one that is dependent on our context. And I have seen that uh, the way in which this pandemic has moved us in both directions, in some settings, We've seen greater trust in our politicians, greater trust in our scientists, greater trust in government to act in everyone's best interest. In other settings, there's been an increase in distrust. There have been conspiracy theories that have driven some of that. And so we've had both extremes in this pandemic. I think overall, the one area in which we have done reasonably well is that scientists have been at the forefront of communicating about this pandemic, and no matter which country you are. And I think in that sense, what we have seen is this greater transparency in science and belief that scientists are, are doing things for the greater good as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Karim. So I see we have five minutes, but I'm determined to squeeze all the knowledge we can out of this group and all, all the and, and to benefit from every single minute. So we're going to do a bit of a lightning round. Um, I'm going to go around uh, just final thoughts and observations from each of our panels. Uh, feel free to, pr to bring forward your own observations or to react to anything that was said. I'll start and go around in no particular order aside from who I see on my screen uh, and uh, starting in the bottom left corner on my screen with Dr. Hoffman. Great, thanks so much. I love the lightning round. So uh, <laughs> great idea. I um, you know, I think that we need to think about uh, what we want to build uh, out of this pandemic. This has been a terrible experience, um, but we also ideally will be able to look back. Uh, hopefully, very soon we're out of it, uh, and then um, hopefully we're able to look back on some things that, like, yes, that was a terrible experience. Millions of people died. That should never have happened the way it had to happen. But that. There's things that we learned from it. We were able to grow from it and ensure that uh, this doesn't 
happen the same way again. I am um, one of the key things I think that our lessons learned around this is around data systems. Um, of course, I'm biased, but that's um, it's also recognizing it's not just about the, that part of the system is yes, a technological system, but even more so at this stage, it's about good governance, it's about culture, it's about uh, public acceptability, it's about Indigenous data sovereignty, as Dr. Karan mentioned. So I think when um, thinking about sort of the legacy from this pandemic, I do hope that we not only have death counts to refer to, uh, but we also have um, things that we were able to build productively uh, advancing um, humanity uh, that comes out of it. That's really gonna be really important for all of us. Thanks. Thank you. And in a minute or less, Dr. Cahon. Wow, man. I've never said anything in a minute or less, but I want to thank the the, the foundation again. And for those in the audience that were listening, um, from the Indigenous perspective, I think it's important to recognize that on my last slide, I said we're still here. We've been here all along. In fact, as we all know, we've been here in since time immemorial. We have actually a place at the table. We have knowledge. We have our systems. We have our methods of science. Science is not new. We, are, we want to be part of the solution. We deserve to be part of the solution. And may I urge all Canadians that are watching on September 30th, take a moment to pause and think of one way that maybe you've overlooked the power and the beauty of Indigenous peoples in this country. Uh, we're getting through a pandemic. There is a time for kindness, and it's every day. Uh, and I wish that on everyone. So, Chini Quich. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rupuli. Yeah. Well, I I think I made uh, a state, in my statements, I basically said, we the science is there, we can do things. The gap is not in the science, uh, is in the investment. I made a provocative statement, a trillion dollars. But also made, uh, I think, provide enough evidence that it's not no argument to spend public money and throw it away. I think I provide the evidence that in invest, this is going to be an investment, investment from which the public sector is the one is going to benefit the most. So let's think about that because if you want to do more data, better, uh, uh, <clears throat> bet, uh, bet, better equity, uh, be more prepared have the science for the vaccines that we need. I, I think a much bigger global effort in investing in prevention and vaccines is going to be needed. Thank you. Professor Abdul Karim. Yes, I think we have seen how important it is to be prepared. And being prepared means ensuring we have you know, built our healthcare systems ensured we have adequate surveillance and we are ready to take on the next chance because there are more coronaviruses, there are more there's influenza, there are many more coming down the line. And as we think about all of those, I think we've learned that fundamentally we have to build the institutions of our society to trust one another, to build that common good that will enable us to stand together to take on each of these pandemic challenges. Thank you. And Dr. Langley, last word to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think the future is potentially very bright for humanity. I think we've seen during this pandemic, um, the progress of science, the ability of science to discover, to rapidly respond to human problems. And now we have to figure out how do we align our values with that? What would a world look like that would provide that science to the world's peoples and not just the most developed nations? Um, and it's more, it's not just the aspect of justice, the justice correlates with the physical reality of the way the world works. Disease somewhere is disease everywhere. And so we just have to align those two ideas, our high-minded ideals, and our ability to employ science to the service of the people. Thank you. Well, thank you. And with that, we are at time. I would like to sincerely thank Gardner for bringing this, us, us together today. Uh, to each of our panelists uh, for the amazing insights. Um, I, I come away uh, having uh, greater insight but also uh, encouraged that all of you are thinking about these issues. Uh, and to our audience, thank you for taking the time today uh, to invest your time in this. Uh, thanks and have a great day, everyone.
Thank you.